Good evening, everyone. I'm Carol Olson Day of the New York Times, and I'm delighted to welcome you to this exciting Times Talks tonight. We are enormously pleased to have as our guest today's leading director of stage and screen. He holds the distinction of being one of the very few people ever to score the Grand Slam of Entertainment Awards. An Oscar, four Emmys, eight Tonys, and a Grammy. And his current play on Broadway, the hit revival of Arthur Miller's Death of a Salesman, is the most Tony-nominated play of the year, with seven nominations, including one for Best Revival, three for Best Performances, two for Best Lighting and Sound, and for tonight's guest, Best Direction. In just a moment, you'll meet him and hear about his work. But first, I'm delighted to introduce our interviewer. You know his byline from the paper and nytimes.com. He is the New York Times writer at large, and his articles appear everywhere from Arts and Leisure to the Book Review, and from Sunday Review to Sports. Recently, he wrote a cover story for the Sunday Magazine about biographer Robert Caro. For five years, he was editor of the Book Review, and before that, spent 23 years as the fiction editor of The New Yorker. Please join me in welcoming Chip McGrath and our very special guest, Mike Nichols. It's a great honor to have you here. Thank you very much. Thank you, it's a pleasure. Um, let's start by talking about Death of a Salesman. Was it your idea to put this on, was to revive it? Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, so, well, that raises the next question, which is presumably you're at a point in your career where you could say, I want to put on just about anything, and they would welcome you doing it. So why Salesman, and why Salesman now? Well, I contend, uh, I'll, I'll argue with the first, first assumption. I couldn't say any play. I'd have to say a play in a star or two for it to be on Broadway. That's where we all find ourselves because we're all, forgive me, salesmen. Uh, what was the second part? <laughs> the, the second part is, is uh, why salesmen? Why, why? Well, because... I think this odd thing has happened, which tends not to happen with even most great plays, namely, it's about right now. It's more about now than it was about then. It's not only uh, prescient, if that's how you pronounce it, uh, but it's, is it how you pronounce it? Yes. <laughs> it's, uh, it's startling if you think about all the obvious things like, Willie talks all the time about being known. Well, the company that lets you be known is, is now one of the biggest companies in the world. Everybody is known on Facebook. And so on and so on. You could, you could trace it right through our entire civilization. So that's, I thought it might be a good moment for it. Right. And the, for me, the main, the main, uh, reason was that uh, Phil would do it. Because I always knew that I would want to do it eventually with Phil. But it took a while for him to face it because it's not fun to do it. It's very expensive. Um, the, you know, beforehand there was, there was a certain small controversy. People saying, well, well Philip Seymour Hoffman, great actor though he is, he's not old enough to do this part. Now I think if you go and see the play, that question disappears in the first 10 seconds. But what was it that you knew that he, he could? Well, let's talk first about not, is not old enough to do which part of this part. There are two parts in the part. One is 43. The other one is 63. So which one are you casting? 
Either way, you'd have to play the other half by acting. Uh, you're stuck. You, you can't find a 40 or 43-year-old, 63-year-old man. <laughs> Lee J. Cobb, as many of you know, when he played it, was 37. Is that right? I did yes. not know that, really. See? <laughs> <laughs> so this is an imaginary problem, you know, that people raise because Willie says, or rather Linda says his age. By the way, she says it two ways. When she's talking to Willie, she says, but you're 60 years old. And when she's mad at his sons, she says he's 63 years old. So we can assume he's 63 years old and she was being easy on him. At my age, I like her for that. <laughs> um, I, th I think that the point is that Phil can do both. And that, let's not forget, it's not a literal play. They're not in a real house. There's, there's no flame on the stove. It's a metaphoric house. It's a metaphoric play. I don't think matching one of the two ages of a character is that important. I think, can he play it or not? The, <clears throat> what you were saying about, the, about it's not being a real uh, house, that brings up an, another issue, which is the interesting thing to me, and I think to a lot of people, was that you chose to use, to go back to the original set and the original music. Yeah. Um, and, and was that just an homage, or, or you thought that... The, the no, it, I don't think that you can do a play from the past, which includes Shakespeare and Aeschylus and that whole crowd, that without knowing how it started, what the impulse was, what it meant then, why it was written. That's part of doing a play. Uh, when Arthur Miller finished Death of a Salesman, he wrote at the top, it is, the, the scene is inside the skull of Willie Loman. That's what he wanted the set to be. That's where he wanted the play to take place. And then over time, Kazan and Milzina said, well, all right, but why not look at this house? Because they were thinking very specifically about the following thing. In the first place, Arthur Miller, I think, was the first playwright, not the first writer, but the first playwright ever to make use of the fact that in our minds we're in two or three places at the same time most of the time. Uh, yes, Joyce did it, various writers did it. No one did it on stage. O'Neill did an inner monologue, who am I and what do I want? But that was just people turning out and saying things like that. It wasn't that they were somewhere else and they took us with them. That's a very important part of this play. That set, when he had started out wanting to take place in Willie's skull, that set excited him very much, and he changed the play to fit the set so that you could dissolve from one scene to the other as in a movie. That was also a first. The fact that those dissolves not only to somewhere else, but most crucially back from somewhere else, if you've seen the play, Quite often in the play, there's a, oh my God, we're back in the kitchen. Or we're in the men's room of the restaurant. I forgot. Well, that's Willie's experience. And the audience experience is that too. That's very important. Because we're not just listening to words. We're experiencing a man who's having a breakdown who is in the past all the time, even when he's in the present and dealing with people in the present. Thus, the set, and I don't know that anybody could write better music than Alex North, and because he was the composer on the first movie I made, and I loved him very much. It was a kind of hello for me, and I knew the score very well, and I thought, I really can't imagine anything better, because again, I think it was the first time anyone ever wrote a movie score for a play. 
and it, it fits so well with the <coughs> dissolves and the never stopping that, you know, when somebody doesn't make provision for that, like in Cosi Fan Tutte, when you just wait, the opera stops while they roll the next set on, because <laughs> Mozart didn't care. <laughs> if I was Mozart, I wouldn't care either. <laughs> <laughs> but we have to care because that's the experience of the playing. Let me, let me ask another, which may, another what may prove to be dumb casting question. I had, I had no doubts at all about Philip Seymour Hoffman. When, when I heard that you had cast Andrew Garfield, I was curious. And I will confess that the, the, when he first came on, I thought, nah, he's not right. By the end, believe me, it's completely won over. But what made you think of him? I mean, he's, he, this was the first time he'd ever really acted in a big play, isn't it? Oh, no. no. He's a big actor on the stage. He played Romeo when he was, I don't know what, 18 at the National Theater. Oh, really? Okay. We only, I guess I only know him as, as a well, movie Well, we actor. only know him that way in, in right. this country. But in, in England, he, he's a, a very powerful and well-known stage actor. And as we saw in, in The Social Network, he has enormous emotional equipment. You saw that instantly in, in, in that movie. And you could buy him as a quarterback. He's an athlete. All three of these guys are athletes. It was one of my great joys while we were working on it. It was the day I gave him a football. <laughs> and they were still holding their pages. And from that day to this, none of them has ever missed the pass. <laughs> but what they soon did was to start throwing the ball Willie and, and Biff started throwing the ball over Hap's head, and he was jumping higher and higher. And then we saw his whole life up to that point. And that's the kind of actors they are, and that's what happens when you are looking for the things that aren't just the words. One of the things that his performance made me realize is that the play is, is more about Biff than I under, ever understood. That, and, was that part of what you wanted to bring out, that, that when we... Well, Biff is very important for all the obvious reasons, but for one more reason. I'm twisted enough to think that the play has a happy ending. Because Biff is saved, and may even be a writer, and Willie is free. There's nothing else Willie could do. There's nowhere he can go. He is not equipped to, to live in the real world, by that point, certainly. Uh, and it's terrible for Linda, although she does have Charlie. <laughs> <laughs> All these things are there in the play. And I think one of the reasons that people cry a lot is, in fact, that, that Biff is saved. And Willie is saved insofar as finally understanding that his son didn't not love him. He loved him too much, like he loved Biff too much. All fathers and sons are glad to hear this. <laughs> That's right. Um, if, if we can switch genres briefly, um, if that's OK, um, I'd like to talk a little bit about your movie career, which, which has gone on for so long, and so many of your movies are, they're the movies, at least in my life, they're the movies you remember who you were with. They're the sort of, when you saw them, they're landmark movies. I remember That's exactly nice where I say. was when I saw The Graduate. I remember exactly where I was when I saw Silkwood. Um, but, and we can go on, you know, Primary Colors, Birdcage, uh, Working Girl. Uh, this this huge body of, to, to use a, a word that's misused a lot, iconic work. What interests me is, is if you talk about these movies with a lot of people, I think they would remember the movies. It might not, they might not spring to mind that these were Mike Nichols movies, that you have amassed this body of work in which the, the stamp is just that they're good. It's, you, know, you, don't have a, you don't have a recognizable style the way mm -hmm say, Scorsese has, or, or De Palma, or... Is that deliberate or by accident? Well, both. In other words, <laughs> it, it's, it's, it depends on what interests you or what draws you. First of all, if you want a, a giant reputation, then do one thing. You know, be a master of suspense, 
or whatever. And then the, you're the master. You're the master of suspense, and we all know it. And Hitchcock was great, and then he wasn't, and then he was. Like all of us, you come and you go. But I'm more interested in, uh, I don't think careers matter because we're going to be dead and forgotten. What's it, what is that for? I, I think it's more like what kind of a time you're having when you do it. Uh, does, it, is it does it feel good? Are you, are you glad to be doing it? And I think the whole point is to, to examine different situations, the, those which you can grasp and to which you can maybe contribute something. But the whole thing that comes with the movies, and I think it comes, came back when it was happening, with little magazines, which movies really needed because there were different kinds of movies. And there was something we don't hardly have anymore. There were art movies. And all the people who made commercial movies, me included, would imitate the art movies because they were the startling ones and they were the ones from which you could learn something. And then they died because there weren't enough of us. Uh, and because we are, as, as Arthur Miller is always reminding us, pure market forces, that the niche things, nothing ever leaves forever. We'll have radio forever, so that must mean we'll have art movies forever, and they'll get smaller and smaller and more and more static, and always interesting. But the market forces are making movies bigger and bigger and bigger till most of us can't grasp them anymore because we don't know all the superheroes and are they all in this one or are they <laughs> <laughs> and which and so forth. It's it's just two different markets. I don't know what my point is. <laughs> but when I interviewed you a, a couple years ago uh, for the paper on the occasion of the, your, the retrospective of your movies at, at MoMA, I think you told me that this movie was made for almost no money. Is that Three and a half million bucks. Yeah. Um, and so that was a different, you were able to do that. I mean, you couldn't make a movie like that for that today, Not right? only were we able to do it, but we had months and months and months to prepare it. And there is no such thing anymore unless you make a movie for one or two million dollars and, and just take the time to prepare it. But that was an enormous luxury then and it is a much greater luxury even now. And we were very happy doing that because it's what you can do with a play, again, not if you're in rehearsal. One of the smart things we did, and Scott Rudin the hero of the whole production, and that he everything we needed, he wanted and needed too, and we did it together, and he made it possible. But he, what we did, I said the ideal way to rehearse a play is to do a workshop and not show it to anybody and never perform it, and then stop and go away and let it ripen for three, four months, and then come back. And that's based on experience in which you maybe do a play in Chicago and some Half a year later, somebody says, you know, we're going to theater. Would you like to get everybody together? And you do, and they get to what they <coughs> used to do, and they think, I don't have to make that face. Why don't I just say it? Everything gets simpler. It gets simpler. And that was what happened with The Graduate. We spent, what Dustin used to say is we could have gone on Broadway with it. We spent so much time with it. But we weren't so much rehearsing as improvising. We did their childhood, we did all sorts of things. But we also looked for things that illustrate the theme. I decided, because the author certainly didn't agree of the novel, and the first two guys who wrote the screenplay didn't agree, but Buck understood what I meant, Buck Henry, and he did agree, and we did it together, and he, I said, I wanted it to be about not becoming a thing in a world of things. And and that's what we did. And that's why, that's what we're doing all the time. At the party, when he says plastics, when he escapes, when he gets with Mrs. Robinson, it's all to avoid becoming a thing, because everything is pushing him, a world of things, into being a thing. And if you have, if you found a theme like that, in a story that actually 
can support that as a center, you do need time. You need to explore all the aspects of it and all the ways it can be expressed, certainly with a camera, but by the actors and the actors with each other and the set and the things that happen and what we see. And it's, it's the greatest happiness is to have found or chosen, whichever way you want to look at it, a, a core of something and continuing to explore it and not being obligated. <coughs> the horror of preparing a play now is that out of town is no use. You have five weeks of rehearsal, or God help us, four, and then you start previews, and you're performing, and everybody comes from New York to see it out of town and often writes about it. You've had no time. That's why I'm, I'm in love with the workshop idea and keeping something your own while you explore it. To go back to the graduate, Another dumb casting question. Um, I read somewhere that, that Robert Redford wanted the part. Yes. And so you went, and I believe at this time, Dustin Hoffman was completely unknown. Yes. So what, and again, a brilliant choice, but what made you, and, and the character in the book is, is a Redford character. He's not a, right, he's a beast. Yes. Right. So what made you? Well, I can answer uh, your question. He, Robert was a friend of mine. We had done our first play together. Well, his second, my first. And when they said, would you like to try doing a play, directing a play, uh, I said, maybe, because I read this play called Nobody's Fool, and I said, well, why don't we do it in Summerstock so we'll find out if I'm any good at directing and if it's any good. And can we have that actor I saw on Playhouse 90 last week? He was a Nazi. <laughs> that was Redford. <laughs> and on the first day of rehearsal, I knew two things. One is that I was meant to direct, because I had no problem. I told everybody where to go and what to do. <laughs> and two is that Redford was great. I could say to him, what if you have a cold? And he'd say, good idea. And I mean, he was amazing. And we did the play, and we had a great time, and we became very good friends. And now I'm doing The Graduate, and he wants to test. And I tested with another, an actress who's a friend of mine, and, and he's great. And then we're playing, shooting pool at my rented house, and he, I said, you can't play it. He said, why? I said, because uh, you're, you can't play a loser. Look at you. <laughs> and he said, yes, I can. Of course I can play a loser. I said, really? I said, when did you last strike out with a girl? And he said, what do you mean? <laughs> <laughs> this is an actual <laughs> quote. <laughs> so, so it wasn't a hard decision. Because <laughs> he had to be a loser. That's what it was going to be about. And it had to be expressed. Inward loser has no meaning and in a movie. So, and then finally, after having seen every guy that age that it was an actor in America, I remember this guy who I'd seen in a play called, I think, The Journey of the Fifth Horse. He was playing a Russian transvestite fishwife. <laughs> and that would be Dustin. <laughs> and we brought him out and tested him, and he was very good. But he was not only very good when we shot it, he was much better on film. And he was one of the few people that I ever worked with that had that deal with Technicolor that overnight in the chemicals, they get better. <laughs> he was one, Elizabeth Taylor was the other. You'd think, well, that's take 32. I guess that's as best we can do. And then you see the next day and you say, oh my god. I didn't have to do 32. She had it on three. But you could only see it on film. And that's why it had to be Dustin. The, if we back up for a minute, you, you talked about how you, you, you you took to directing very naturally, and you found it, it suited your dictatorial uh, impulses. But I, I'm curious how you got there, because, because my understanding is you, you began and, and you had your first success with Elaine May mm -hmm. um, as a sort of brilliant improv duo. Right. And I mean, had, and so you were an actor of sorts, but you weren't, had you, did you ever appear in real stage stuff? So I mean, so when it came time to be a director, how did you know how to be a director? Well, here's what happened. First of all, 
If you were improvising, and we, we started at Compass where they, their big idea was let's all improvise. Yeah, and that was it. <laughs> and those of us who went out on stage had nothing except that idea. You don't have any lines, so improvise. Uh, do you have any rules, any ideas for what? No, just do it. I mean, I'm simplifying, but that was basically the idea. So the first thing is that you're terrible for a long time. That's the main thing about improvising. <laughs> and then sudden, not suddenly, but slowly something begins to happen. And what you're really doing is because you've, night after night, you've been a catastrophe. And, and you've been so unhappy. And then we were in Chicago, so, and we were re near the lake. And sometimes we would actually go jump in the lake after a show <laughs> because it was so humiliating. <laughs> But slowly, slowly, your unconscious is waking up. And ultimately, it comes to save you if you do it long enough. And I always remember the night where I was working with Elaine, because I always somehow was better with Elaine. And they all ran into the bar where the <laughs> actors hang out and said, come quick, Mike has a character. <laughs> and from that, I, I got pretty good. And Elaine was always better. And that's what it was about with the two of us. She could go on forever as a character. I could not. I, my only choice was to move it forward, to have a plot. And that's when I learned, it's very interesting to learn the rules of drama viscerally inside yourself to save your ass, because then you really know them. And what we learned, especially Elaine and I, because we hit it off, and we thought somehow the same way, and we began to build a group of scenes, which is why we eventually were able to do what we did. But we discovered something really interesting, is that if you're making up scenes, I don't know what it's like for a writer, but I think it's not that different. There are only three kinds of scenes, and I'd love to hear some more if somebody's got them. Elaine always said, when in doubt, seduce. It was a great rule, because immediately something's happening. You have to have something happening. That's what a scene is. So if you seduce whoever it is, it could be the mailman, it could be a passing dog, it doesn't matter. <laughs> seduce and you have an event. The other is, of course, a fight. Most scenes are fights, and some plays like Virginia Woolf are entirely fights, and one or two seductions, <laughs> as it were, to spring a trap. And so you got seductions, you got fights, and you got negotiations. Most of Shakespeare is either a fight or a seduction or a negotiation. Once you know that, you know what to do with a scene. And you'd be amazed in rehearsing plays how often scenes turn out to be fights. And you've wasted all this time not knowing it. And the day you realize it's a fight, it's all done. All the lines make sense. You understand at last why they're saying these things. And these are the things that improvising teaches you because it's to save yourself. You're out in front of all these people with drinks, <laughs> and you've got to do something. And then you know them in your bones. And then the place seems somehow more uh, attainable because you can do that with scenes. And then what you can do in plays, what you can't do in improv, because you don't have sets, bottles, glasses, beds, is business. Business is my best friend. <laughs> and that's what Barefoot was all about, my first play. Is a, a friend of mine, Dick Benjamin, replaced Redford after a year and a half or something. And he said, I can't do this. He said, there's so much business, I'll never learn it. <laughs> you come home, you undress, you put your tie in the dictionary, you go to the refrigerator, you take out. It never stops. Because they were more in the course of their lives when they did that. And then they did what's necessary with Neil Simon, who writes very funny lines, if you don't punch them, if you don't play as if they're comedy, but are living, if you're in the course of your lives, undressing and grabbing a bite out of the refrigerator, the lines will take care of themselves. If you sell them, God help you. And that's what we discovered very fast. And that's what can be lost if there's no old kvetch to say, no, don't 
do it like a comedy line. That's the whole point. So all these things, it seemed that by accident that improvising teaches you some of the most useful things. So, so you, you, you learned that, and then, you, and then you made the switch to movies. And I believe the first time was, was, was Afraid of Virginia Woolf. Yeah. So that's a whole other step. And what, I mean, were you, so you, all of a sudden you're on stage, you're, you're on a, sorry, you're on a set, you're directing Elizabeth Taylor, Richard Burton, you've never directed a movie before in your life. Right. How, what's that like? <laughs> well, I'll tell you a weird thing. I thought about this, obviously, because even I was a little surprised. I didn't know if it would look like a movie or not. Uh, is what I, what I had forgotten was that when we were in New York, I mean, I came from Europe and everything, we were growing up in New York, and my parents were not happy and they fought a lot. And I would think, who needs this? I'm going to the movies. So every day after school, I would go to the Lowe's 83rd or the RKO 81st Street. I would go to the movies. Sometimes I wouldn't understand it, and I'd say to somebody else in the row, is he is dreaming? Is this a dream? <laughs> I remember doing that. Uh, but the thing about reading or watching movies is if they excite you, you begin to learn things about how they're done and store them. You don't know how to categorize them or describe them, but you know what they are. And you remember. I remember details of movies. For, oh, I always do, but I did from when I was like, however old I was, 8, 9, 10, 12. Um, so that in a way I'd been, and, and by the way, when I knew I was going to do Virginia Woolf, I, I studied the guys who meant the most to me. Yeah. Like George Stevens and A Place in the Sun was pretty much my Bible. Really? Yes. I think I must have seen it 150 times. And I learned from it. And if you look, you can see it. It's not that I copied it, but I learned what a shot is and what a shot expresses and what you can do with a camera to tell the story, hmm. which is entirely different from how you do the scene, which is a whole other thing. Right. That's, and that movies are different. From Carnal Knowledge, which is one of my favorite films, even though it's, it's, it's not the one that comes to everybody's mind first, it comes to mind second after The Graduate. I think part of why I like it is uh, so much is it's, it's the one movie in your whole body of work that that's, to me stands out because it's so much darker than the rest. Am, am I right about that? Yes, this this yes. goes someplace that you, except maybe in Virginia, if you never went again. No. <laughs> is that because you never wanted to, or, or the material didn't come along, or, or...? I think once was enough. Uh, I think once was enough for some feelings I had and thoughts I had. Don't forget, it was very much Jules Pfeiffer. Jules, when Elaine and I came to New York, he was our first friend. He was our first person in the audience. I mean, so we got New York, we got Compton and Green and Bernstein and so forth, but first before anybody we got Jules who rightly felt that we were on a similar track and he said he'd seen us on television and been totally stunned that we were people on television who were actually petting in a car and talking about sex, real sex like in life and that he associated with that because that's what he wrote about. So we became very good friends and then I was getting ready I guess to do Catch-22 or something. Maybe it was while we were working on The Graduate. I can't remember where it was. But what I remember is that it, he was a friend and he sent me this play, Carnal Knowledge. And it's pretty much what was on screen. And I read it and I called him and I said, I don't think it's a play, I think it's a movie. Static though it is, I think it's a movie because I want to see the women who aren't talking. I want to see the reactor rather than the actor, which you can only do in a movie. And I have to say also that I think it wasn't a universal truth. It was 
certain generation of men, don't you think? Yeah, yeah, I think that's right. I, yeah. I think it <laughs> ended with that generation. It's not that it was single, it was maybe two or three, but it was so hopeless, and they were so much about getting laid and not about any kind of human connection. Uh, it just couldn't, it couldn't last. And it was particularly despairing for all of us, for everyone. And when you were partly part of it, then when it was over, you were so relieved because you didn't. I once said to a friend of mine, I said, we actually have the same feeling about sex that middle class girls do. And we did. You know, you say you wanted a relationship and somebody you cared about everything. But there was nowhere you could say that <laughs> without sounding like a pussy. <laughs> <laughs> And then it was over. Right. <laughs> Candace Bergen is wonderful in it. Nicholson is tremendous in this movie. And Margaret is tremendous. She's forgotten about, I think, when people talk about this mm -hmm. movie. And at the end, there are these two astonishing performances from each of them. They're these long rants, you know, yes. each of them. What was, I mean, was that hard to get that out of them? Or was that just part of, that was just? Well, nothing was hard to get out of Jack, because <laughs> Jack was, this was before Easy Rider came out. Oh, really? I saw Easy Rider before it came out. And I said, that's who I want for carnal knowledge. And we immediately got to be very good friends. And then we got to Vancouver, where we could do everything in, all in one place, except a couple of days in New York. And uh, I said, Jack, the only thing you have to do for yourself and for me, for the length of shootings, you have to give up grass because <laughs> you have to speed up your rhythm. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, okay, Nick. <laughs> <laughs> and he did. He did. And because he is and was a great actor, part of what great actors do is give a tremendous gift to their partners. And that's what began to happen in rehearsal. Artie Garfunkel had never acted. So what did Jack do? They moved into the set on the stage and were roommates. <laughs> I mean, they spent a couple of nights there. And then he had Artie over a lot to his house, where, of course, he had a hot tub and various young ladies. And <laughs> He formed a friendship with Artie. He went after Candy. He <laughs> was horrible to Anne Margaret when we rehearsed. And when we shot the big fight, we shot her side first for days, with him saying unrepeatable things to her. <laughs> and he upset her no end. And when we turned around on him, his voice was gone. He had given his all for her performance and done it with her. That's what happens with a great actor who's also a great guy. And it was a tremendous gift to everything, to Anne Margaret, of course, and she knew it, and she loved him. And, and it was not that she isn't great, because she was great and is great, but she simply hadn't done anything like this. He knew how to help her. And what starts to happen, whether it's a movie or a play, is that the, the experience, the emotionally facile, the, the actors for whom it's second nature, are part of what they're doing is, is, is creating the atmosphere the, for the others. So that if you're in a movie with Meryl, you're just, the main thing to do is just keep looking at her. Um. <laughs> Sadly, we're going to have to skip over Meryl. Um, the, we're going to skip over a lot of movies. We could, I, we, this is so interesting. We could be here all night. If oh, that's could, okay. We could do it. <laughs> uh, but uh, Charlie Wilson's War. Um, was, was that the first time you ever worked with? with no, no, I had done a play with Phil, uh, really? The Seagull. Well, that's right. That's right. And while we were doing this, he's entirely different on a movie from a play. Entirely. We're doing the seagull, and for a few days you couldn't hear him, and then he yelled all through, and then he wasn't where you blocked him. Where is he? He was all the way over there, 
And it was always sweet, and we never had any words. And, and after the, about the fifth day of this, I said, Phil, he said, I know, I know, I'm sorry. I have to do all the things I'm not going to do. <laughs> so I'm not going to interfere. Whatever his process is, I'm good with it. But in the movies, he's entirely different. The movies, you say, OK, Phil, you want to run through it? No, let's do it. OK. I would say, that's great for me. I'm happy already. He says, can I see it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One more. <laughs> then he'd do it. It's even better. i say, OK, that's OK. God knows what he does. I have no idea. I never will. But whatever he does, and it's the same with Merrill, it's the same with great actors. I don't think they know exactly what they do. They certainly are not going to talk about it ever to anyone. And I think that's a very important part of it, is whatever their process is, please don't even ask. When we were rehearsing Salesman, they invited us all on a show like this. It was a radio interview in front of an audience. Don't ask me why. And we had warned the guy that they're in rehearsal. They're not going to be able to talk about their process. But of course, he asked. Um, like Linda would go like this, la, 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 just the questions she didn't want to hear, never mind the answers. <laughs> and they all just shut up completely because they can't. And when you're working and preparing something, like that scene or like any of these scenes or like the play we're doing, you certainly don't talk about what they're going to do. That's their business. You talk about what's happening and what the activities of the scene are and what's really, what the events are. But you never, never talk about how you do anything or what their emotion should be because that's, that's personal. That's their job. I'm also curious, <clears throat> what made you choose this material? I mean, it, it's, a, it's a very unlikely story, this sort of renegade Texas congressman gets himself involved in supporting the, the and maybe we wish now that he hadn't, <laughs> <laughs> supporting the, the Af Afghanis against the Russians. What, what was it that, that made you think, yeah, that's a movie I want to do? I was. Well, it came to me from Tom Hanks, who had bought the book. OK. And he said, would you want to direct it? And I said, I'd like, I've read it. I said, I'd like to meet Charlie Wilson. And I, I had lunch with Charlie Wilson in New York, and I was stunned by his, well, his power. He was a beautiful, tall, benign person who was friends with everyone on the block, anybody who came by. And he was a, a very rare man. And I realized that what had happened to him was that he learned about the situation with Afghanistan and us and Russia, and he fell into it and became another man. And I thought, for all of us who are reading this stuff all the time and trying to keep the countries straight, and no, I'm sorry, I meant Syria. We, we spent a lot of time to begin with saying things like that. And the story of him getting drawn in, getting passionate, falling in love, and dedicating his life to this hopeless war. What about that? This war that has gone on forever. This nation that has never been defeated in war. Not by Russia, which has never been defeated. And there are certain individuals and countries that somehow didn't get it. <laughs> we won't say anything now, right. but <laughs> it, it, it seemed worth doing and like it would be fun, and it was. The, I, I was struck by, I also think it has a very smart script by, by Aaron Sorkin. And when I was thinking earlier today about, about talking with you tonight and, and thinking about 
the question I asked you earlier, that, that Nichols movies don't have in some ways this recognizable element that runs through all of them. And then I, it occurred to me, yeah, they do, which is they all have very smart scripts by smart screenwriters. You look down the list of people you worked with, Elaine May, Buck Henry, Aaron Sorkin, it's Jules funny you Pfeiffer. Say that. That's you very think, interesting to me that you should say that because when I got the AFI thing, when I get an award, I'm always so ashamed that I'm sort of paralyzed because I should have said no, is my feeling always. <laughs> uh, and always is the operative word here. And, you know, Elaine came out at that one and said, I, uh, thank you so much for the applause. She said, I hope you like my dress. Uh, I bought this dress 35 years ago for Mike's first Lifetime Achievement Award. <laughs> <laughs> and so I'm always sitting there in shame. And I thought, I can't sit here like this. I've got to give myself something to do. So they did all these clips. And I thought, why don't I see if the good movies have a principle that separates them from the not? And I did, and I found it which is that every good movie I made, I had a buddy. I had the person you call at 3 in the morning and say, I think we're wrong. I think what we could do is. And they say, well, that's good, but I was thinking. I mean, they've been asleep and everything. They go right into it. You have to, I have to have that. I don't know what, what auteurs do. I don't know what they do because I'm not an auteur. But to, to do whatever the hell I do, I do need that buddy or those buddies. When I have them, the movie's usually okay. When I don't, it's not. With the exception of Virginia Woolf, because I had, although he wasn't there, I had Albie, mm -hmm. always. <laughs> I knew him, I knew what he meant. We had talked about many things, because we sort of started in New York at the same time, Elaine and me and Albie. So I, he was my buddy in a strange way. But other than that, I think that it is about being buddies, movies are. And you need them to make them. The, the TV version of Angels in America, which is, is after all, a, a movie of a play. What interested me about this was, was the, the task of taking Angels, which is one of the great plays of my time, of most of our times, and, and, and putting it on the, the small screen must, must have been a challenge. And then it's magical in a movie way with all these special effects. And then if you think back to Angels, if you were lucky enough to see it on stage, and the magic was all visible. And yeah. this, is, yeah. this is the real difference, isn't it, between movies and, and or one of them, between movies and plays? Yes, it is certainly one of the differences. It, it's, I, I think that when you're talking about Kushner and working with Kushner, all rules are suspended because he's not like anyone else. And to join him in, in what he's doing is a, is a rare and wonderful experience. And he became somebody I, I need to go on living. I, I, I love him in that way. And he, he uh, He's very, he's not like anybody else because he knows everything, which is daunting. But he also has the secret of staying not only creative, but the, the, the thing that he is, a great writer, which is never to be satisfied and to, to never, ever look at what he's accomplished or what we all think of him. He doesn't want to hear, he doesn't want to know. He manages to block it successfully. Because as we were talking about certain other writers and everything, it, it becomes a terrible problem when you are a reputation and you have to keep doing it. He has no problem with any of that. Uh, and to, to understand what he did and to carefully try to get in there and say, well, maybe for the screen with all this, he did an amazing thing. He's not like any writer ever. I told him at one point, I, I think I can do all of this, and I want to do all of it. And I have to tell you, there's, some, there's a, a section where I think the string will snap, and that is the Mormons endlessly crossing the plains. I think it was like 30 pages. 
I can't do it. I can't keep that string from snapping. I want, I need that woman in the covered wagon and the greatest speech in the whole play about what God does. But could I please just skip the, and he said, of course, of course, <laughs> no problem. And then he did an amazing thing. He cut it out of the printed version because he liked it too. And when you, I watched, I saw the play when they did it recently at Signature and it was wonderful. But the chain, he kept changing it. He kept working on it. There is no playwright I've ever heard of. I mean, what you hear about Shakespeare, maybe he used to hand things to writers from the pit. But, but he, he's never finished, and which is both ennobling for actors and also a nightmare because he's never finished. <laughs> and they have to keep relearning new things and relearning new things. But you're part of something so astonishing that it's worth it. And that's what happened to us in, in Queens shooting it for a year. We shot this thing for a year. Every day I'd go to work and we'd shoot some more. And I actually forgot that people would ever see it. <laughs> <laughs> and I was completely happy. We all were. We were in a kind of paradise because we were doing Kushner and we were all together and every day was joyful. And then at the end I thought, oh my God, it's going to be on television? <laughs> but then that was okay too. But I didn't, we didn't think stage, screen, we thought, here are the things we have and that we can do. How do we accomplish these scenes? And then we had some ideas. This is probably an unfair question. Which do you like more, theater or movies? Well, I like both as a point. I think that each teaches you something about the other. I think that each is the thing that you lose, scary. When you return to either of them, you're scared. And scared is the first thing you lose. When Elaine and I were a comedy team and we were on TV a lot as guest things, uh, I got to the point where they say, five, four. I, I, I started to not literally go to sleep, but just zone out. I was so unscared and therefore not good. You have to be good, scared to be good. But if you switch back and forth, you're, you're scared forever. <laughs> <laughs> I'm no good for a play until I've heard it, until I, there are actors in the room and I hear it and I see them, what they now call interact. Um, I don't... Uh, I'm not very good at, at text by itself. I mean, I know when I like a play, and I know when I like what it's about and what the events seem to be, but I, I need to see some human beings in a room saying these things to each other. And then I immediately begin to see what it's about and what the scenes really are about and begin to figure out how one could make this manifest. Movies are something else. Movies are a dream. Movies are so much about to whom any given moment is happening if, that the camera has to choose whose experience is this moment and the next whose and so forth. So that movies are more about the script and looking at where the movie would take place, finding a location. Finding a location can transform everything. A good example is Elaine and I loved Kajo Fall for years and years because it's one of the great plots. It's not about gay people at all. It's about family. And we couldn't get the rights and we couldn't get the rights and then we did. And I had worked on the stage version and that didn't work out and there was going to be in New Orleans and that didn't seem quite right. And and then the art director said, have you ever been to South Beach? And I said, no, actually, I haven't. And we went. In the first 10 minutes, I said, here we are. <laughs> and I saw the whole movie. South Beach was the movie. And, and Elaine and I, in working on making American events instead of South of France events, knew that to bring a, a congressman a very straight-laced congressman into South Beach was to be in comedy heaven. <laughs> <laughs> and it's different things on different movies, but there's always 
some physical thing that tells you, ah, that's what it is. When I said objects and the graduate, I thought, well, let's just do it. Let's just say it. Let's make him an object. Let's put him on a belt just like his suitcase. And we'll intercut him on the belt, the suitcase on the belt. Two objects. Get it? Well, the point is, no. Nobody gets it, <laughs> which is correct. I mean, you don't want to be sitting there thinking, I think he means that humans are objects. <laughs> <laughs> but the point is to get it done, because you're telling a secret story as well as an open story, a clear story. So it's very different from a play. Plays are about where on stage everybody is. When you have everybody in the right place on stage, the scene can happen. And by the way, if they're in the wrong place, the scene can't happen. That's partly what rehearsal is about. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you. <laughs> you were great. You were great. Thank you so much. Thank you.